1. Please be aware the following story contains references to animal cruelty, but no animals are actually hurt during the course of the story. This happened to me last night, and I am left still feeling pretty uncomfortable about the whole exchange. Before I jump into it, I'll give a little background context. I work with a guy named Mike who is two years older than me. Shortly after meeting Mike, he friended me on Facebook, and I accepted because I wanted to avoid any awkwardness at work, and don't really use it often anyways. Mike would send me weird messages that were often out of the blue and unrelated, but nothing creepy or worthwhile. I figured he just wanted an excuse to talk, so I did my best to give him the hint that I wasn't interested without being too rude by responding with one-word answers, days later or not at all, and bringing up the fact that I have a boyfriend frequently, whenever he spoke to me both in person and online. It hadn't been a huge problem up until this point, just more of a mild annoyance that I mostly didn't think about. I also started to realize from my experiences with him at work that he may have an issue with social interactions, which led me to believe he was even more mild than I had previously thought. He has a hard time picking up on sarcasm or body language, and usually starts conversations by bringing up the same topics over and over again. Most of our conversations in person involve him asking a series of questions that I answer out of politeness, followed by awkward silence. I usually feel forced to end by asking, You? Anyways, last night I was working, and he came to visit unprompted from a different floor later in the evening, when most of the residents were already in bed. We are both PCAs. He started up the same way. Have you seen any good movies lately? Do you like to drive fast? I've seen you speeding in your car after work. Do you drink? Do you go to the beach? I was only half paying attention because I was doing paperwork and trying to make it pretty clear with my body language and repeated, what? Responses that I wasn't too interested in continuing his interrogation. But then he asks me, Have you ever killed a hog? I thought I heard him wrong, so I ask, what? And turn to look at him and he repeats, Have you ever killed a hog? I laugh a little awkwardly because it was unexpected and more than a little weird, and respond, no? To which he stands there smiling and because it's so awkward. Eventually I stupidly ask, have you? Mike laughs and says simply, yes. This leaves me weirded out enough to ask why, to which he responds, what do you mean why? Me flabbergasted. Why did you kill a hog, dude? Mike laughs. Me confused and desperate for context. You just went out and killed a pig. Mike, no, it was for a function. I let out an uncomfortable laugh of relief. Before things can go back to normal, he hits me with, Yeah, I was the one that got to kill it. I got to see it beg for its life before I cut its throat. At this, I'm completely shocked. Creeped out and a little worried that no one else is around right now, because I know him enough to know that he is not joking. Why did you say it like that? Mike laughs, even though there is no humor in my response or voice, and repeats himself. I watched it beg for its life before I slit its throat. I respond, dude, stop, seriously. Mike smiles and I pointedly ignore him now as I text my boyfriend because I'm pretty thoroughly disturbed. It gets quiet for a few moments before he says, yeah, it took a long time to bleed out too, much longer than the chicken I killed. I respond, Mike, stop. And he says, I thought you liked horror movies. I say as firmly as possible, yeah I do, but this is creepy, and you're making me uncomfortable. Mike continues to linger, repeating one of those same creepy statements every once in a while, 
but I am now fully ignoring him, since he has repeatedly disrespected my request for him to stop, after I told him I was uncomfortable. Finally he stops, and then again out of the blue, Do you have an Instagram? Even though I'm pissed, I'm more than a little relieved with the change of topic, and respond with a very rude and angry yip, to which he says, oh, cool, and then proceeds to go back to his floor. I wish that was the end of it, because as if I was not freaked out enough, ten minutes later the phone at the desk rings, and I, thinking it is a resident's family member, as per usual, answer, but no. It's Mike calling from his floor, and he seriously asks me, Do you want to go eat octopus later? I'm completely done with this dude because I'm angry, and respond, No! To which he says, Okay, how about pork? I tell him a resident needs me, and hang up. Busy relaying the story to my boyfriend over text, when finally my co-worker on my floor for the night makes an appearance. We are sitting together, but I refrain from telling him what just happened because he is a lot older. Might think it's funny or misunderstand and is friendly with Mike. But the phone rings again ten minutes later, and I ask my co-worker to answer the phone this time. It's Mike again, and I can tell by the side of the conversation I can hear that he was looking to speak to me again and asks about the resident I said I needed to help. My co-worker doesn't know about the problem, and jokingly tells him to come down and hang out with us. And before I can make any sort of gesture that says, Hell no. My co-worker turns to me and says, Mike wants to know your favorite type of wine so he can bring you some. This guy is relentless. I tell my co-worker I don't want any and he relays the message, before hanging up a few seconds later. The phone rings again before we leave, but this time, it thankfully isn't him. I'm a little worried about walking out to my car at this point, because I am super uncomfortable and he has already made it clear that he knows which car I drive. So I called my friend to talk to me as I walked through the dark parking lot. It was 11pm and my boyfriend's phone had died. But thankfully, Mike does not make an appearance and I got home okay. Maybe it was an overreaction on my part, but the whole thing creeped me out, and I am honestly pretty worried about the next time I will have to work with him. 2. This incident happened last week. I just finished up my summer classes, so now I have time to share this with you guys. Quick reference, I am a 5'2", 105 pound female. I was visiting my parents and decided to go down to the park by their house, to write poetry. I love writing poetry by the gazebo in that park, because it's surrounded by a beautiful garden that inspires my writing. The park is behind their house, but you have to walk past two baseball fields and a stretch of grass to get to the gazebo. Relevant later. When I got to the park and sat in the gazebo, there were a bunch of people that seemed to be having a party of some sort over by the shelter and picnic benches. After sitting there, writing for about 20 minutes, a guy wearing a neon yellow shirt and talking on the phone walks over towards me. I thought this was a bit strange, because this was a bit away from the rest of the crowd and the gazebo is tucked away behind a garden. The park is big enough that to come over specifically in my direction was a little strange. He was speaking Spanish, and I know some Spanish, but I only heard bits and pieces of what he was saying, because it's hard for me to keep up with a native speaker. Whenever I speak Spanish with someone, I usually have to ask them to slow down a little, so naturally, I didn't catch all of what he was saying, but he kept saying blonde girl. My hair is bleach blonde, but so are millions of other girls, so I didn't read too much into it. I also heard, when will you be here? Throughout the conversation he kept glancing over at me, but after a few minutes he went back to the party. A couple minutes later, another guy walks over to me in the same spot as the last guy. He was also on the phone speaking Spanish. Like the previous guy, I only caught bits and pieces of what he was saying. 
but he also kept saying blonde girl. This raised some red flags, but neither of these guys looked frightening. They were both very handsome and clean cut, so they didn't send off any creeper vibes. After a couple minutes, he also went back to the party. About 30 minutes went by and I noticed the party was clearing out. At this point, I was the only one left in the park. I had to go to the bathroom, so I got up and started walking towards the restrooms. I saw a rusty, dark blue truck sitting on the entrance exit of the park. It was just sitting there idling, so I thought it was weird that it was not going anywhere. As I got closer, it pulled away and turned right. After that, I didn't think anything of it. I went to the bathroom and headed back to the gazebo to continue writing. A bit later, I lifted up my neck to stretch it because it was feeling stiff. When I looked up, I saw the same rusty blue truck sitting in the parking lot in the space that was closest to my location. But it was facing the far exit, so I only saw the passenger side of the truck. At this point, it wasn't dark out, but the sun already began to set. From where I was, they were close enough that I could tell there were a few men sitting in the truck. The passenger side window was down, and the guy in the passenger seat was looking in my direction. And he was wearing a neon yellow shirt. I looked closer and noticed it was the same guy who was talking on the phone who kept saying blonde girl, and asking when will you be here. I picked up my phone and started walking quickly back on the stretch of grass, past the baseball fields that leads to my parents' house. As soon as I started to walk away, the truck started driving too. It looked as if it was going towards the far exit, but as I kept walking, it turned around to go towards the other exit, where they were idling at earlier. From where I was, I could get a full view of it, so they certainly had a full view of me as well. I started to walk faster, and they started driving faster as well. They turned left, which was the direction I was walking. We were parallel, maybe about 50 feet of grass between them and me, so they wouldn't have been able to get to me unless they got out on foot. The speed limit on the road is 40 miles per hour, but they had to have been going about 20. The guy in the driver's side kept peeking his head out and staring at me, so I was afraid that they were going to park the truck and get out on foot. They finally went under an overpass around a curve and were no longer visible. Maybe I'm thinking too much into this, and I'm sorry if it's not as creepy as the other stories, but I can't help but feel stalked, and that they were planning something and figured I wouldn't understand any Spanish when they were talking by me. I'm not entirely sure what to think of it, but my gut tells me that these guys weren't entirely harmless. This is actually the second scary encounter I've had while writing in a park. But at least I wasn't directly attacked in this one, like I was in the one that happened a few years ago. I once thought that writing was a healthy outlet for me, but it seems to be getting me in trouble. 3. This went on over the course of a year, with the last incident taking place in December of 2016. I used to own this green 1998 Toyota Camry. It was my grandmother's car until she gifted it to my parents, who eventually gave it to me as my first car. It was nice and reliable, but I have a bad habit of letting my cars accumulate a bunch of stuff before cleaning them out. Because I still lived with my parents, they would use the car from time to time if they needed it. One day I notice a bunch of fishing lines with hooks on them in the back of my car, on one of the rare occasions that I clean it out. A bunch of the hooks are embedded into the upholstery, and more are between the creases of the seat. It takes me a while to get them all out, and I almost prick myself several times doing it. I have no idea how long they were there, as the last time I'd cleaned this much of my car out was months ago. At any rate, I'm annoyed. At first, I thought that my dad had put them there, as he had recently used my car to transport a bunch of old junk for a garage sale. 
I ask him about it. But he told me he's never seen any fishing hooks or lines in any of the old stuff of ours, and nobody in my family even fishes, so it wouldn't make any sense for us to have it. He's also the only other person that has used my car at all in the past year or two. I'm the kind of person who locks up everything every night. I triple check my car doors, and if I'm even a little uncertain as to whether or not I locked up, I will go back to my car and check, no matter the inconvenience. I also park it where I can see it from my bedroom window, and hear if anyone tampers with it, so I doubted anyone could have broken in and just assumed my dad missed it, and didn't think anything more of it, until a month later, when I found even more fish hooks in my back seat. At this point, I asked my dad about it again, but he figures I'm either pulling a weird prank on him, or someone is breaking into my car. I wonder, though, why anyone would break into my car not to steal anything out of it, and leave fish hooks instead. It just didn't make sense to me. To give you an idea about how weird this is, I live in a neighborhood where everyone knows everyone, we all talk, and even have a private Facebook group that started due to a drug house at the end of the street cropping up. Though at this point it wasn't active, and as a sort of neighborhood watch group that always posts whenever something suspicious happens. So I don't have any neighbors I don't know for miles, and none of the ones I do know are this shady. Again, without any explanation or clear motive, as the days and weeks pass, it fades to the back of my head. I get a new job selling mattresses, as I'd been unemployed focusing on school for a while, and move out of my parents' house to live with my girlfriend. This is where things turn from weird to extremely unsettling. One night we decide to go to a nearby Winco to get something to make food with, and I notice my back seat has a bunch of fishing lines and hooks in it again. Startled, I look around for any sign of someone being nearby. I tell her to get back in the house, and I sit up and stare at my car until morning comes from our bedroom window. After triple checking every door and window to ensure they were all locked, but I don't see anyone or anything. I get ready for work, and she gets ready for her college courses, and we leave. The store I was working at during this time had a weird L-shaped design to it, with two different entrances and a cafe taking up the space between them. There was one entrance that was easily visible from the front desk, and another that you would have to get up to go see. As I was closing up the night after the last incident, I go to turn off the open signs and see in the center of the obscured hallway an entire roll of fishing line, coiled up, but with some of the line leading to the floor, where a pile of hooks sat. I had no customers that day, and never heard the door alarm go off. I then noticed someone had turned the door alarms off, but neither I nor my co-worker had ever tampered with the device before then and it was behind the front desk. I was shaking. Someone had been stalking me and leaving these lines, but I had no idea what to do. Call the police. Other than the fishing lines and hooks, there was really nothing to trace back to anyone. My store had no cameras, and corporate would never agree to installing them. Neither my family nor my girlfriends could afford security cameras either. I figured the best I could do would be not to appear as frightened as I was in case whoever was doing this was watching me. I thought that if seeing something like this didn't make me go about my day any differently, and I didn't give whatever reaction this person was looking for, that they would give up and go away. For several more months, I would find fishing lines and hooks in my car despite it being locked and my parents, being the only people with extra keys, being much too busy with the construction of their new house and their jobs to take time out of their day to prank me. Once or twice I would leave notes in my car, asking whoever it was why they were doing this and to stop. And I would find the notes gone 
whenever the lines and hooks appeared, but with no response. Eventually, after a series of misunderstandings and disagreements with her family, I decided to move out of my girlfriend's house and moved in with a couple of friends into their apartment until my parents' new house could be completed. The very last time I had an encounter with the lines and hooks, I came home from work to find them strewn about the living room. Stuff was knocked over, and a few things broken, but nothing was taken. My friend, his girlfriend, and their baby were all gone at the time, so no one was home when this happened, save for his cats which were absolutely spooked and wouldn't come out from under his bed for hours. I still don't know what this person wants or wanted, why they were stalking me in the first place, or what the fishing lines and hooks meant. No one I know is huge into fishing, and I specifically go out of my way not to make enemies or cross people, even purposefully giving people more than I take from them so that I don't seem like I'm out for myself. I really don't know if it was someone I know or a stranger really good at covering their tracks and freaking people out. All I know is that I will have anxiety over this for the rest of my life, and I routinely stay up until 4 or 5 in the morning, because in addition to several other traumatizing experiences, this has made every bump in the night a potential threat to me. It's been almost 9 months since I've seen anything more from this person, but instead of feeling better, I feel more uneasy that someone followed me through that many changes in my life and didn't do anything further than breaking into my work and my friend's house. But that any time they could, because no safety measures seemed able to deter them. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the read. I'm shaking as I'm typing this out. I haven't really talked in great detail with anyone about it, because just describing it makes me feel like a loon. Not only that, but I don't want to worry my friends and family when there's nothing they can do about it or vindicate them if it's one of them that pulled a prank on me. This will likely be a mystery I never see solved. Additional info, I seem to have created a little confusion as to the status of my relationship with my girlfriend. After moving out of her place, we stay together and are still together to this day. Also, she doesn't have a driver's license, so it can't be her. Thank you, everyone, for listening, though. Hey, everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 239. Big thanks to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I hope the girl who was writing the portrait there in number two doesn't actually give up. Uh, perhaps just think of some alternate locations uh, to to write in. But I certainly wouldn't let the creepy, creepy people of the world hamper your creativity. Okay, and with that, I think I'm going to head off for now. So, until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.